This morning, we're going to look at the marvelous ministry of Jesus using Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 25 as our authority, as our guide, so that with this series, the, the point of this series, as Jeannie said a while ago, so that we better understand, like, who is Jesus? How, how, do, we, how do we know we're living with Jesus, the person and, and his earthly ministry? I don't know about you, but on Wednesday nights, I've enjoyed the, the first couple of episodes of The Chosen. Uh, we begin at 5.30 on Wednesday nights, eating a, a great meal together, and then witnessing The, the Chosen Season 2. And, and in The Chosen series, it's really high, which I think sometimes is, is a tough thing for us as, as 21st century believers to do. How, how do we understand the humanity, of, the, the humanness of, of Christ? In, in particular, this past week, how he might have handled interpersonal communication amongst his disciples, how they were ranking themselves and and how Peter wanted to, to take charge in a, in, a, in a different way. We get a glimpse uh, almost weekly about what it would look like, again, for Jesus to live life with these disciples. And so if your family hasn't been a part of that just yet, this Wednesday, 5.30 for a, a meal, uh, followed by the Chosen uh, Season 2, Episode 3. This episode this week um, highlights Jesus' healing ministry, the healing ministry of Jesus. The, it's a continuous stream of Jesus' hard work as he's healing people from, from all around Galilee come to see Jesus because they know uh, one moment with Jesus and their lives could change forever. One, one moment, one instant with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he who has power over all, one moment with them will change their, their lives. Jesus, for the majority of this episode, he's away from his disciples. He's away from them, busy about the Lord's work seeing person after person, families who are in need uh, of healing that only he can provide. When I was 10 years old, uh, my mom and dad sat sat me and my my two little brothers down um, on our old uh, green pleather couch, uh, late 90s pleather couch. I'm just trying to create context for you here uh, for this story. That has nothing to do with the story whatsoever. I just had that in my mind. Uh, But you guys know what I'm talking about, and you probably even feel it and smell it as, uh, as I say that. But they, they sat us down on, on our couch um, in Ada, Oklahoma at the time where we were living, and they told us, they told us that my dad had been diagnosed with cancer, that, it, that a tumor the size of a, a grapefruit had, had, had grown into his pelvic bone and had begun wreaking havoc on, on his body. And as they explained this to us, um, myself at, at 10, my youngest brother at 5, that those things weren't really connecting. I knew cancer was bad, but it, but I didn't know necessarily how bad that was. Weeks go by, and, and they begin chemotherapy. My dad first um, obviously loses his hair, and, uh, and his body becomes frail. And, and my dad, who at 10 years old, as, as, as many of your 10-year-olds probably did, um, I thought my dad was the strongest man on the planet. Um, nobody stronger than my than my dad, but at ten years old, my dad needed my help as a tiny ten year old to even get off off the couch for For six months, my dad res- received treatment chemotherapy treatment on a, on a daily basis and, and just as things went from bad to worse, just as it looked like if there was no hope, uh, no chance to save his life. Um, Church, let me, let me tell you this, that Jesus intervened in my family's life in, in a miraculous way. One Sunday night at our, at our church in Ada, Trinity Baptist, Ada, Oklahoma, um, they held a prayer service for my dad. It had gotten that bad um, to where we were thinking and planning for, for his life outside, life outside of my, my dad being with us. They, they held a prayer service for my family. And, and as a new believer at that time, only, only knowing Jesus just for a, a year or so, was somewhat like skeptical about, okay, why would we be doing this? Is there something else we could be doing, something more to, to save my, my, dad's, my dad's life? But church, I, I will tell you, God showed up that evening, and, and he continued to show up. As I witnessed friends and family members intervene on behalf of my mom and dad and my brothers, my, my skepticism turned into surrender, like many of yours has as well. I witnessed a, a loving church family trust in a holy and all-knowing and, and wise God as, and they, as they asked him to heal my, my dad. 
weeks go by after that prayer service, and my dad's strength becomes becomes back, comes back to him. Months passed, and chemotherapy is lo- no longer necessary. Weeks after that, cancer completely eradicated. Twenty three years later, even today, as I talked to him last night, still cancer free. That ten year old boy who now stands before you, 23 years later, witnessed an almighty God do an incredible thing in my life that I'm forever impacted by the power, the healing power of our God. Our our Jesus, as we'll see in our text, who healed every disease, every affliction among these people some 2,000 years ago, the same Jesus that healed my dad 23 years ago, the same Jesus that's still in the power of, of healing today. Amen, church? Let us marvel at this ministry of Jesus as we we read our text, as we study our text this morning. As we do every week, before we jump into our text, let us pause just for a moment. As we do, would you, the best you know how, would you ask God to speak to you, speak to your family in these next moments? God, we trust you, and we are so thankful for your word. We are so thankful, Jesus, um, that you are about uh, the power of healing, and within your ministry, uh, you've accomplished many things. We are unholy. We are unworthy. Father, even on our best day, um, we do not deserve you, but we are so thankful, Jesus, to be able to come to you. Well, I want to intercede on behalf of my church family this morning. Would you would you help us as we dive into your text? Would you speak to us maybe in a, in a fresh way? Would you help the words of this book jump off the page and into our lives? And we'll thank you for it. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. So again, our text is, is dealing with the early ministry of Jesus. He had just come out of the wilderness after being tempted for 40 days by Satan. He's begun calling his disciples. And immediately, immediately, he begins to minister to people. Throughout his entire ministry, as the Gospels are recorded, he never deviates from what he's doing in these just two simple verses out of Matthew chapter 4. So this morning, if you're willing, if you're able, would you stand for the reading of God's word in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Matthew records, and he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. 24, so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. 25, and great crowds followed him from Galilee to Decapolis, and from Jerusalem to Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Amen. may be seated. So this morning, I want us to look at what this ministry involves, what this ministry of, of Jesus involves in regards to this text and other supporting passages that we'll pull up. Even, even amongst our community here, there might be question as to what Jesus was about during his earthly ministry. What was he doing? Who did he spend his time with? The, the chosen episode that we'll watch this Wednesday night even highlights the disciples' confusion. As to why Jesus would be there. They, they thought Jesus was going to come with a sword and with an army to defeat the Roman Empire and to push back darkness in, in that way. And so for, for us, I want us to be really clear about what he was doing, what he was sent to accomplish, and, and what he's done in, in the process of doing so. Th- this text, uh, again, authored by Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples, helps us better understand the details of what Jesus' life and what living with him was truly like. So first, if you're taking notes, I I want us to look at the manner in which Jesus approached his ministry, the manner, the the people that he spent most of his time with. 23, verse 23 of this Matthew 4 passage, he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease, every affliction among the people. So a question I think we should begin with as we look at this text The question we need to understand if we're going to understand the ministry of Jesus is simply, who is it that Jesus has come to minister to? Who is it that Jesus spent his time with? What type of people was he concerned with? The the text reveals an answer to us. First, in 23, we see that Jesus 
came to the religious. Jesus came to, to the religious. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, and he stopped off in synagogues. He was teaching in their synagogues. Many times, Gospels of Jesus, Jesus is teaching in these synagogues, these places of worship, much like we've gathered here this morning. Jesus is spending time with those who are, are religious. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, right, these ultra-religious, legalistic Um, I know everything. I'm going to let everybody know that I know everything from the way I dress to the way I speak to the way I pray. These Pharisees took pride in their religious ceremonies and their observation of the law, how they constructed their daily lives. They lived a very strict lifestyle, and they were faithful to the synagogue. So a question we might need to ask, why was Jesus wasting, spending his time in, in the synagogue? Maybe you're asking, I thought Jesus only came to seek and save the, the lost? And, and the short answer is, he did, right? He did. And, and he came to the synagogue because there was many individuals, many devout individuals of the faith who, who thought that they had everything together. They thought if they came to worship and if they adhered to the law and if they did all the right things and said all the right things, that maybe they could save their lives, but they were far from God. You see, church, an act of worship, mere religious activity, cannot and will not save our souls. It, it, does, it doesn't work that way. These were, these were faithful in attendance. They adhered to the law, kept traditions and feasts. To them, to look at them, they appeared to have everything together. Everything was working for them. But their works alone weren't enough to save. So Jesus came preaching to the synagogues, and he came to preach the gospel. Jesus still comes to religious people today. He meets even with us even today. There there are many amongst us who are faithful in in attendance, faithful in Sunday school, faithful to read our Bibles on a daily basis, faithful to to pray. Many of you have been baptized, and and some of you in this this congregation have have aligned your life here even recently to to, to become a member of our church. And, And yet, though these things are good, all those things are good, and what's asked of us, they cannot and will not save our souls, amen? If religious activity is all you have, then, then church, you don't have much. You don't have much. Jesus says, I want more than religion. I want a relationship with you. Jesus came to the religious, but he also came to the rebellious. So he went throughout all Galilee, taught in their synagogues, and proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus' preaching wasn't just confined to the synagogue. He didn't just set up shop at at all the largest churches in each city and and give presentations of the gospel. No, he he spent most of his time outside of the synagogue. Matthew records Jesus um, later in his book of of his gospel, chapter 9, verse 12, as he's talking with the Pharisees about his earthly ministry jesus says to these pharisees those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick for i came not to call the righteous but i came to call the sinners quick survey of the four gospels paints this picture of jesus spending more time with sinners even the darkest of sinners deep enslaved in their sin than he does in association with the religious elite and he oftentimes was ridiculed for this right Oftentimes, he was ridiculed, but he came to those who didn't believe. Church, he's still reaching rebellious people, even today. Even those who are far from him. Even those who we cannot even imagine would turn their lives over to him. Jesus still comes to the rebellious today. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never been saved. You've never come to Jesus and and trusted him as your Lord and Savior. There is still hope for you. Jesus comes to the rebellious. Jesus comes for those who are far off. He gave his life so that you might be saved. So Jesus came to the religious and he came to the rebellious, but he also came to those who were rejected. He came and went throughout all of Galilee, preached in the synagogues, preached the gospel, but he also healed every disease and every affliction among the people. Jesus also came to those who are sick, And those who were diseased, most of the time, we know that these individuals were outcasts of society. Because of their 
ailments, because of their sickness, they were thrown to the outskirts of their cities. Many, many viewed them as cursed of God and would have nothing to do with them. Theirs, theirs was often a life of loneliness, a, a life of despair, a life away from, from people. They had to beg and hope for someone to show them even an ounce of compassion. What's incredible as we read this is that our Jesus didn't shy away from even those that society rejected. Our Jesus made it his mission, made it a core facet of his ministry to welcome those and to heal those who were rejected, to give them to give them hope. And even still today, Jesus is still comes to those who are rejected. He has compassion for those who seem to be forgotten. For those who seems like no one no one cares about. And so maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling like life is hopeless. That no one cares about you. You're lonely, that you are far away, that no one cares about you. Let me encourage you today that, that our God sees you, that Jesus sees you and he can meet whatever needs you might have. There isn't a life so troubled that Jesus can't heal. He's actively drawing people to know him, to experience this powerful healing. Second major theme in, in the ministry of Jesus that we see in these couple of verses here is that Jesus brings this message of salvation as he comes preaching. So secondly, this message of salvation, Jesus is, is found taught teaching and preaching everywhere he goes. What, what is he preaching? What is he saying? What message does he share with, with all those people who will hear? It remains the most powerful message ever, ever told. So throughout his teaching ministry, as recorded by, by the Gospels, we see that he comes preaching a message of repentance and a message of redemption. First, this message of repentance is, is the first public a demand of Jesus' public ministry is repent. He's, he spoke this command to all who would listen. It's a, it's a call for radical inward change toward, towards God and towards people. Uh, look with me, if you will, a few verses back in Matthew 4, verse 17. Matthew records, from that time Jesus began preaching. And here's what he was preaching, folks. He was saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This word repentance in these passages literally means the act of changing one's mind. The act of changing one's mind. True biblical repentance goes beyond remorse. It goes beyond regret. It goes beyond, you know, I'm just going to turn away from this sin. Jesus came pre preaching this message of repentance and, and he meant it to radically change their lives. This repentance in involves a complete and irreversible change of mind and of hearts, and of actions. Repentance, as Jesus is preaching here, and teaching here, repentance recognizes that, that our sin, my sin, your, your sin is offensive to a holy and righteous God and calls us to a deeper devotion, calls us to daily giving up our lives so that, so that my heart, your heart, our hearts are aligned with what God desires most for us. His message still remains true today. He tells us to repent. Recognize that the sin in your life is offensive to God. Confess to God that you are lost without him and you need his forgiveness. Maybe some of you here this morning need to receive this message and receive Christ as your savior. Jesus comes preaching this, this message of repentance. Because in Jesus' mind, if there's no repentance, then there's no salvation. Jesus also brings a message of redemption. He comes preaching this message. He preached the gospel and he healed the sick. And, and in this, we see this beautiful picture of the redemption that he brings. The, the word redemption or the word redeem means to buy out. To buy out. To redeem means to buy out. This term was was used specifically in reference to, to purchase of a slave's freedom during the day of Jesus. The application of this, of this term, when we match it up with Christ's death on the cross, it, it's quite telling. If we, if we, as Christ's followers, are redeemed, then, then our prior condition was one of slavery. 
And we were enslaved to sin, enslaved to death, and in opposition to, to a holy God. But God, through the work of Jesus, has purchased our freedom. So we're no longer in bondage to sin. To be redeemed, to receive this message of redemption from Jesus, then is to be forgiven, to be holy, to be set apart, to be justified, to be free, to be adopted sons and daughters of the one true king, and to be reconciled. Church family, Jesus is still in the business of redeeming lives. He longs to set those who are enslaved to sin free to to live with him. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel trapped. You feel trapped in your own sin. Maybe sin that no one knows about. Secret sin that, that, that keeps you ensnared to the things that are not God. Jesus' message is clear for you. Repent. Repent in your sin, of your sins and believe. Allow Jesus to heal your broken heart and set you free. So the first big theme we see is the manner in which Jesus approached, the manner and, and the way and, and the people that he spent most of his time with. Then we see this message of Jesus that he came preaching repentance and redemption. Lastly, in this Matthew 4 passage, we see the mercy of Jesus. Look at verse 24. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. They brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. For those who had an encounter with Jesus... They were never the same. For those who walked all the miles just to meet with Jesus, they were never the same. He showed them compassion. He showed them a love and a desire and hope to bring peace to their lives, to all who would come to him. Each one that got to Jesus was made made whole. Their sickness was completely healed. So in this, we, we we see first that Jesus brings healing. Jesus brings healing. People from all around Galilee were bringing sick people to Jesus. They they were sick from various diseases and ailments. And and a simple interaction, again, with Jesus was healing them from these things. Can we we stop just for a moment, church, and, and just marvel at this work, at this earthly work of Jesus, that, that Jesus, God in the flesh, firstborn of all creation, image of the invisible God, was healing droves of people. People will see in this awesome episode of The Chosen that just lined up for days just to meet with Jesus. Some who were lame and sick from birth, left with no hope, left with no comfort. They knew nothing about a a normal, healthy life. And one moment in time, one instant in time with Jesus, and everything changed for them. We just marvel at the work of Jesus in this. Our King Jesus is the great physician who is still in the business of healing. Jesus brings healing. We also see that Jesus brings hope. 24, and those who were oppressed by demons and those having seizures and, and paralytics, and he healed them. Now, some of you want me to dive into demon possession this morning, but we won't go there, okay? We'll... We'll let, you, uh, we'll let you talk to Kurt um, after, after service. You want to talk through demon possession. We're not going to take a deep dive into that, but I think it's worth noting, right? I think, it's, I think it's worth noting that Jesus didn't shy away from even the most violent of encounters with, with people in, in this state of mind. These individuals were hopeless. They were helpless. They, they themselves could not help them themselves. They were hopeless apart from Jesus. They could do nothing about their condition. They had no say in the matter. And I think though we sometimes separate ourselves from from things like this, like this is some strong language, I think the same is true for us. That, That apart from Jesus, we can't help ourselves. Jesus brings us hope. Jesus brings healing, he brings hope. And then lastly, Jesus brings peace. Think about this, all the, all the diseases, 
all of the element, uh, all the ailments, the possession, the seizures, sickness from birth, trying to to get through loneliness. All these things, and Jesus not only healed them physically, but he, but he gave them the gift of peace. He gave people the gift of peace. Jesus brought peace to those troubled lives. Those from the bottom found a, a new reason to live the next day. Those minds who were devastated by sin and the weight of the world found a peace that surpassed all of their understanding. Listen, this world can't offer that kind of peace, can it? This peace only comes from Jesus. Only our King Jesus offers you that today. And so maybe you're here this morning. You're seeking peace and you're seeking contentment. And you've tried all the ways of the world to no avail. Could, could I encourage you this morning? This peace only comes from our King Jesus. There, there are many in, uh, in our midst here this morning in our, in our congregation, many needs that are going on. Many things that maybe you have told no one about. No one knows you are struggling. No one knows the pain that you are feeling. No one knows the, the hurt that you are experiencing. Some of you here this morning, you are, not, you are not saved. If you were honest with yourselves, there is no relationship with Jesus. But that could change this morning. You can be saved. You can experience this peace that we're talking about. All you have to do is give your life to Jesus. Confess and repent of your sin and come to him by, by faith. Jesus came to seek and save the lost and that, that might include you this morning. Coming to church, participating in religious activity, those things are awesome. Those things are great. They're great encouragement. But they alone will not save your soul. In a moment, we're going to set a time aside for you to, to respond to this word, to this gospel. This gospel that Jesus saves. Jesus heals even the most broken of hearts. I'll be standing in the back this way. We've got other pastors in the, in, in the other side. Other people that want to meet with you, speak with you about what a relationship with Jesus means. Who want to see you follow Jesus. Come and, come and speak to us. We would love that. Christ's followers in the room. Maybe this morning you need someone to intercede on your behalf. Maybe you need someone to pray for you. Maybe, maybe you're hurting. Maybe you're dealing with adversity and pain and sorrow that, that no one knows about. Maybe you're facing inner turmoil job change, job frustration, what, whatever that may be. Maybe, maybe this morning, church, you need healing. Your body is broken and you need healing and you need someone to pray that through. Would you come find us and, and we would love to do that. Whatever the need, come right now as the Spirit is pleading with you and as you respond to God's word. Let me pray for us and we'll respond. God, we love you. We're so thankful for you. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the great physician who not only heals us physically, but, but gives us new life. We thank you, Jesus, for the peace that you offer us, for the hope that is, that is in a relationship with you. Jesus, we praise you for, for giving us an opportunity to have a relationship with God, for laying, laying down your life so that we can be known by God and know him. Father, would you help us as we respond in this, room, in this moment? Families all across this place would, um, would turn their eyes upon you to, to fixate their hope and their peace in you. And we'll thank you for it. Lord, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Church family, let's stand and respond this moment.